So in this segment, I want to continue talking about the Cold War, but I want to move beyond Europe. You may recall in the last segment, I talked a bit about the Cold War in Europe and the thawing and the freezing of relations between the Soviet Union and the United States during the 1950s. I think we need to understand how the same relationship was sort of playing out worldwide, not merely in Europe, because the Cold War was a global event. And in order to understand how it played out worldwide, how the Cold War played out worldwide, uh, I need to make sure you're familiar with the process or the movement toward what historians have come to call decolonization that followed the Second World War. In the wake of the Second World War, remember that many of the European powers that had been involved with imperialism were actually considerably weakened. Militarily, uh, at home there was destruction from bombing, vast bombing, um, but militarily, economically, the traditional powers often lack the capacity to maintain control over their territories globally. And a good example, of course, is, is the British Empire. You may recall that in 1947, Harry Truman had announced the Truman Doctrine in part because Britain had decided it was no longer capable of supporting resistance to communism in Greece. Well, that had been a traditional role of the British Empire. And so across the globe, we began to see longtime independence movements leading to fruition, leading to actual results in 1946, 47. And it's a process that will continue, uh, not merely in the immediate post-war years, but will continue really well into or toward the end of the 20th century almost. And independence movements really continue even today, but in terms of decolonization, it's really focused on undoing or breaking the bonds that were created under in the imperialist era, in the, in the 1800s, for instance, and even before under um, colonial rule. So, what this means for the Cold War is there's the existence of this third way. And what I mean by that is you have the Soviet Union on one side, you have the United States on the other, and you have those nations that sort of orbit around the two opponents. But you'll also have globally in the Cold War, and in Europe as well, you'll have a third element, we'll often referred to as the third world. If the U.S. is the first world, the Soviet Union is often referred to in the West as the second world, and you have the third world. It's the third way, and that is a way of neutrality. It's a way of seeking to avoid direct entanglement in the problems of the Cold War that would result from alliance with either side, East or West, uh, U.S., Soviet. The United States, as does the Soviet Union, they want to bring as many nations on board as they can. And there are good reasons to do this. One, you know, you want to ensure that you block the expansion of your opponent, containment for instance. These nations provide really good opportunities for intelligence gathering. And there's also for instance, the United Nations. Every you know, vote counts at least somewhat. And you can bring those votes to bear in that deliberative body. The United States will also seek to create a sort of alliance structure in the Pacific, actually more than one, that's not dissimilar from NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. In the Pacific, you have CETO in the 1950s, S-E-A-T-O, the Southeast Asian uh, Treaty Organization, which brings together some of the major players of Southeast Asia in a mutual defense arrangement like NATO that can help cover um, countries like South Korea after the Korean War or the Korean conflict concludes. I think it would be fair to say that the United States and the West, 
come into this contest for neutral nations with a bit of a disadvantage in that they have a history of imperialistic behavior. 1946, the United States will finally sort of release control over the Philippines. France will struggle mightily in the early 1950s before letting go of Vietnam. And Britain will struggle until they finally are forced to let go of India. There are, is a long history of racism and abuse. And that's not to suggest that the Soviet Union was uh, pure as the driven snow. It's merely to suggest that the Soviet Union hadn't been around quite long enough, perhaps, to fully uh, let it be known just how vicious it could be. So perhaps there's a slight disadvantage for the West. But there are always those neutral nations that really wanted no part of either side that didn't directly advance their own local or national interests. As early as uh, 1955, the non-aligned nations met in a summit in Indonesia, and it was there that they announced the possibility of finding a third way in this Cold War. 1961, President Tito of Yugoslavia held a summit of non-aligned nations. And among those who were in agreement with this notion of the possibility of being non-aligned, you know, kind of be careful, uh, stay out of it, were Nehru of India and Nasser of Egypt, major players in the world with major populations who didn't want any part of this Cold War. It's also worth noting here, or reminding you perhaps, that Eisenhower had wanted to save money. And one way of doing that was relying on nuclear weapons. But another way was relying on non-conventional forces to achieve goals that were, you know, seemed to be achievable in the third world. It would be difficult, for instance, to overthrow the Soviet Union, you know, with a, a squad of um, specially trained soldiers, perhaps. But it might be possible to tip the balance in a civil war through a covert action using special forces of some kind, or even CIA operatives. Plus, using special forces, or CIA operatives in particular, allowed the United States a degree of deniability. Remember with Gary Powers and the U-2 incident, the United States initially denies Soviet assertions that the U.S. is overflying Soviet airspace. Common practice in the world of intelligence gathering and subterfuge. Well, in the 1950s, the United States will particularly employ the Central Intelligence Agency as a tool, as an instrument, especially in the third world. And in the end, it's probably not going to win the United States many friends. 1953, just to give you a few examples, in 1953, partly, in no small part, because of a fear of loss of access to Iranian oil. The United States, through the CIA, will engineer a coup that will place in power a king or shah in Iran. I mean, we will take an active role in 53 in unseating and in installing a friendly government in Iran, and again, it's, it's really about access to oil and American investments and in oil interests. We will, in 54, become actively involved in what amounts to a sort of civil war or revolution ongoing in Guatemala, involving the United Fruit Company, and again, American interests. Vietnam, is another interesting example, but we're going to hold that one off for a little later um, because we decided to do kind of an entire lecture on, on Vietnam that will hopefully bring a lot of these points together. One of the major events, though, of the 1950s occurred in Egypt. And it, it tells you something about 
U.S. operating in the third world that I think really is, is worthy of consideration. We'll talk about Cuba, too, here in just a bit. But anyway, um, Gamal Abdul Nasser rose to power and wanted, I think, a strong national Egypt. Understand that Nasser's rise is taking place within the context in 1948 of the establishment of the state of Israel in Palestine. By and large, Israel's emergence is taking place in this post-colonial era, area of decolonization, but also a Cold War era, if you think about it. 48, Israel becomes a state. That's one of those little factors, you know, that affects the capacity of these newly independent Arab nations, for instance, from, you know, necessarily associating directly with the U.S. and the West. Well, getting back to, to Egypt and, and Nasser, in 1956, in 1956, the United States will withdraw funds in no small part because Nasser refuses to support U.S. aims in the Cold War, the U.S. will withdraw funds from a huge product, project that Nasser has undertaken, which is to construct the Aswan Dam, to actually dam the Nile. Nasser, trying to raise funds to continue this major project, and water is extraordinarily important, of course, in Egypt, will seize the Suez Canal. Now, the Suez Canal, remember, is this major linkage traditional to the British Empire, vital to the British Empire, that allows British shipping and most European shipping, really, to go through um, the Suez Canal into the Indian Ocean rather than going all the way around Africa. And my directions there were all messed up. I'm sorry, it's hard to think east, west, and reverse sometimes. You'll be able to see that on, on a map. The British and the French actually put together uh, a plan in conspiracy, really, with Israel to bring down Nasser. They were not willing to give up control through this process of nationalization of the Suez Canal, which was such a vital, vital link for them. So on October 29th, 1956, Israel invades Egypt to try and reassert control over the canal. But really, you know, Israel's point here is to do with Egypt and the past conflict over Israel's existence. The French and the British soon come in on the side of Israel because their interest is the Suez Canal. Eisenhower absolutely fumed at this. The United States had not been consulted. The United States did not approve of the effort to take the Suez Canal. And the U.S. will not back the effort. In the end, the Suez Canal remains under the control of Egypt. Egypt pays uh, for the canal, some $81 million, and it goes to the Soviet Union to build or supply funding for and technical assistance for construction of the Aswan Dam. That's a really good example of the delicate gamesmanship going on, as well as, I think, the multiple interests involved in these events of the Cold War in the Third World. But it's also a good example with Egypt and Nasser of how easy it was to push a nation toward a greater affinity for one side or the other, and how difficult it was to maintain neutrality throughout this Cold War period. A lot of what I've talked about here, I think, will play in just a little later in material we're going to talk about. So consider this a bit of foreshadowing. And we'll pick up in the next segment with the Kennedy years and will lead us on to the Cuban Missile Crisis and ultimately uh, to one of the best examples of how this Cold War decolonization played out for the United States in Vietnam. <laughs>